Hello, and welcome to our weekly Sunday morning service at Woodlawn Baptist Church in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. We hope you're blessed with this message. Well, we've been continuing our study of the, the great scroll of Isaiah. I don't know how many have had a chance to go online and take a look at that digitized copy of what they have over in Israel. Anybody? Anybody can go and check that out? That's super good. Oh, I encourage you to do that. Um, somehow we'll have to share the link with everybody. I should have put it in the bulletin. Maybe next week I'll do that. Just so you've got it. Um, or maybe we can text it out to you or something. Send it, we'll send an email. That's the easiest way. Because yes. that way you're on your computer, you just click on it and it goes. All right, we'll get there someday. We'll <laughs> learn about this technology. Um, but it's beautiful to be able to scroll through and see the very words, the very written in the very way that it was when, when Jesus stood in that synagogue and they handed him the scroll and he read from it. And the crazy thing is that scroll that's in a case in Israel is that old that it could have been a couple hundred years old at that time when Jesus read in the synagogue. That to me is insane, mind-boggling, I just can't grasp it. But praise God that somehow God has preserved that scroll for us, and you need to see it. We've been studying that scroll, uh, of course the English translation of it, because I can't read it in Hebrew. Um, and in the first 39 chapters, we've already seen some of the ways that God has revealed sin and salvation. He's been just gradually releasing some of this information that has been you know, held in God's knowledge for, for <coughs> since before the world began. And he's giving it out to, to Isaiah as he can handle it and write it and share it with those around him. And so God's revealed sin and salvation to, to Isaiah, and then last week, uh, as we saw, to Hezekiah, both of them as individuals, and then to Israel in the north and Judah in the south, and even to the surrounding nations and to the ends of the earth. That's what it keeps, Isaiah keeps saying that too. This message isn't just for them, this goes to the ends of the earth. And we're included in that. And in the remaining 27 chapters, God begins to reveal even more details. So we're getting to the good stuff now. God starts revealing the, a lot more details about his plan of salvation for mankind. And some of these details also reveal what some Bible teachers will call the unique unity of God. Charles Ryrie, uh, in his ex expository uh, Bible notes, he wrote that Isaiah chapters 40 to 47, to, I'm sorry, 40 to 48, what we're going to take a look at today, and I know we don't have all day, so we'll, we'll, we'll move through quickly. But Isaiah chapters 40 to 48 emphasize the greatness of God. And it really reveals a lot about God the Father, the greatness of God the Father. Chapters 49 to 57, which I'm still trying to see if I can, I don't know if I can do all of that in one week, next week. It, it might take a couple. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. This is too much for my little brain to handle. But chapters 49 to 57 really reveal the graciousness of God the Son in a very beautiful way. And then chapters 58 to 66, that's the rest of the book of the scroll, reveal the glory of God, the Holy Spirit. So we really do see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit begin to be revealed. And Isaiah, I believe, is one of the first, if not the first, in Scripture to call God Father. He doesn't do that until later in the chapters. It's not until chapter 63 I'm not going to read all of chapter 63 today. Um, but 63, verse 16, says this, Doubtless you are our Father. 
Though Abraham was ignorant of us, Abraham didn't know how many of the people of Israel would be born later, and Israel does not acknowledge us, so the north didn't, you know, take care of the south. But you, O Lord, are our Father, our Redeemer from everlasting is your name. So Isaiah, in that one verse, repeated it twice, calling out to God as our Father, our Redeemer, <coughs> and everlasting is his name. Uh, he could not be talking about a human because we, some of us are getting older and we know we are not everlasting. And in this body, I don't want to be. I want a new one. <laughs> I don't know if you, it happened to you, but as the weather changes, uh, there were a few more aches and pains this morning. I was not loving the idea of getting, getting out of bed. To tell you the truth. But, but Isaiah 64 also says, But now, O Lord, in verse 8, now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. Some of you have sung that song. You are our potter. And we are the work of your hands. It's just a beautiful uh, picture of God our Father. So before we go any further into that, I want to read from Isaiah chapter 40, which is what we'll take for verses uh, chapters 40 to 48 today, and I'll skim through. I know I'm going to miss a lot of really good stuff, but I think you need to see what, what, I, what the Lord has, uh, has revealed to us. So let me read uh, Isaiah 40. I'm just going to take right now verses 25 to 31, and then we'll pray. Some of you have heard much of this too. To whom then will you liken me? This is God speaking. Or to whom shall I be equal? Says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high. Go ahead, walk, step outside, look at the sky, he says. And see who has created these things. Who brings out their host by number? He calls them all by name. By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God? Have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would take your word. Open it to us, O God. Help our minds to grasp the wonders, Lord, that you have revealed. And then help us, O oh God, to fall in love with you. Lord, that we might know you. That we might be in awe of the wonder of your salvation that is poured out upon us, O oh Lord. May we be like those that wait on you and gain our strength from you. I pray, O oh God, help us to then rise in the strength you give and become doers of the word. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, so we see God revealing himself and then, and then challenging even Jacob and, and, and Israel. He says, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? He says, you're saying things that don't make any sense. My way is hidden from the Lord. You know, God doesn't see me. Oh, I'm having problems. And the Lord doesn't know. Don't be so foolish. God knows. God knows. Does he always do things the way we want? Absolutely not. <laughs> C.S. Lewis once said, uh, he, he's not a tame lion, you know. He's not a, he's, no, he's not tame. But he's good. But don't think he's tame. 
Our God is not a puppet that we should tell him what to do. You know, he created this universe. He holds it together. He knows exactly what's going on in our lives. And he has a plan. And, and uh, so we, we have the right and the duty to lift our concerns up to him. As we saw with, with uh, Hezekiah. Hezekiah got bad news. What did he do? He laid it out before God. He said, Lord, you see this. This is terrible. I'm in a bad situation. God encourages us to lift it up to him. He sees what we're going through. But he also asks us to wait on him. His timing is perfect. And we need to trust him. As part of that waiting, that's trusting. If I go to the bus stop, I have a belief that at a certain time, and I know Lisa used to drive up, so she knew, there was a certain time they're supposed to be there. Right? And you trust that that driver is following the schedule and not going off to Dunkin' Donuts or something. You know, it's like, no, it's like you know, they're supposed to be here. And so when you wait for them, it's waiting with that expectation that they promise to be in a certain spot at a certain time, and you wait. And if they're a minute late, I know they hear about it, right? It's, like, I don't know. You can be late, but not early. Really? Oh, late's okay, but not early. Oh, because that's what people arrive at, at the stop. And it, mm, okay, all right, that's worse. All right. As long as they don't take off, yeah, right as you're coming. <laughs> yeah. you missed it again. Um, but God, God is never late. He's always on time. It's just his time doesn't always match what we think. You know, it doesn't match what, what I might want. So recently, uh, several people have asked me, what does our church believe? And I thought, in the 15 minutes I have right now, I'm going to share some, some of that, okay? Out of pulling some things from Isaiah. But I need us to go over, because it's healthy for us, to remind ourselves of what do we believe. And so right on our website, so I won't keep us to, on this too long, but you can go there. If you go to, what's it called, woodlawnri.org, and you can pull down, what is it, when it says uh, at the top there in the middle, about us or something, and then who we are. And under the who we are, scroll down, and it's our doctrinal statement, which sounds really dry and crusty, right? It doesn't sound like, who says things like that? Doctrinal statement. But here is a summary of some of the things that we believe. Is it everything? No, because it's boiled down into uh, little bite-sized chunks. The second one um, there of the we believe, uh, on the left-hand column, it says, we believe there is only one true God the Divine Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, eternally coexistent, and there's a typo that I have to fix. But it was actually a typo from way back. It was from a document we had in the office. It says, in there it says, in equal essence. But that's flipped. It's supposed to say, equal in essence and attributes. Equal in essence and attributes, yet distinct in office and activity. And what that means is God in three persons. As we sing in, the, in the, the hymn, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Right? The refrain beginning and end of the first and last verse. It says, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. And we should know that the word, all of you should know this. The word Trinity, because you'll get challenged by people on the street or whatever, they'll say, you know, Trinity is not in the Bible. No. <coughs> But the concept is there. And we see it even in Isaiah. Going way back into the Old Testament. The Apostle Paul didn't dream this up. The early church didn't dream this up. This is there. Read it for yourself. It's actually there. And then there are other people that will say, to seeing a doctrinal statement on a website, well, you know, doctrine divides. And yes, it does. It divides truth from falsehood. <laughs> like there's the truth, and then there's the non-truth. The people who are misspeaking out there. Yes, it divides. But doctrine also unites. Because as I think about our brothers and sisters all around the world in some of these nations where, where they are not free to worship God, but when they hold to these truths, the truth of Scripture, 
we're brothers and sisters. It doesn't matter our culture or our language. When we realize they're, they're holding to the word of God and the truth that are there, I said, you are my brother. And as we saw in that short video, you could have a guy who's walking around in a gorilla uniform, you know, not the animal. The, so the, the, the military people out there in the jungle. And so he's putting on a, a front or a face like he's a tough guy with a, with a machine gun. You don't know who his family is, who his grandmother is who's praying for him. Uh, I get shook up just thinking about it. Uh, that, that there are people believing the great truths of the Bible and praying for their kids and their grandkids in horrible situations all over the world. And we've got to pray for, for the next generation. During So one of the great things, if people challenge you on the idea of the doctrine of the Trinity... Just have them read for themselves um, the, the narrative that Matthew gives us of when Jesus was baptized. It's a great picture. It's a vivid display of the presence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Matthew recorded it this way. In, uh, I don't know what, which chapter. I'll get verse 16. Uh, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him. So we have the Son of God being baptized. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him, the Holy Spirit. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now who could that be but God the Father? This is my beloved Son. We see it. And we have a diagram that people have come up with. I don't know if we can, can share that. Because the great creeds of the past tried to explain this. And there's a long one, which I won't read today, the Athanasian Creed. And what it's trying to do is explain this. And this symbol is not in the scripture. I know, somebody drew it. But it's trying to explain the relationship. We believe in one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father is God, well, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And yet, as revealed in scripture, the Father is not the Son. Right? The Son is not the Spirit. And the Father is not the Spirit. In the, the same way. And so in that way, we believe in one God, not three gods. Now, can I comprehend this, like, fully? No, I can just tell you that this is what the Scripture says. And we see it. And could Isaiah understand it? I don't believe so. He, he couldn't have drawn that, that drawing. He could just give us what God revealed to him. And that's what we're going to see. The unique unity of God. There is one God in three persons. Let me see. I'll read to you um, John chapter 10. Just to let you see some of the things that Jesus said about this. John 10 verses 24 to 33. This got him in big trouble. The Jews surrounded him. Now, again, Jesus was raised Jewish, too. So when it says the Jews in Scripture, it means the Jewish leaders. They surrounded him and they said, How long will you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Now, was he denying that he is the Christ? No. No, he's saying, I, I did tell you. And everything I'm doing shows that that's who I am. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life. Now, who can do that? Only God can give eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. And then he says a very unusual thing, right, for us. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. He is. He's greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So Jesus is saying, I and the Father, we're one. I am one with the Father. And then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered them, 
many good works have I sh have many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? And the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God. They knew exactly what Jesus was doing, what he was saying. He was claiming equality with, with God the Father. So God is uniquely one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's look back at Isaiah chapter 40 again. And uh, we see some very clear characteristics or attributes of God. Uh, notice verse 25, right? It started earlier. To whom then will you liken me, or to whom shall I be equal? See how God is unique. He's the Holy One. And holy means set apart. Um, so God says, to whom shall I be equal? God is equal only to himself. Nothing in creation even remotely compares to him. And so that's another thing that separates. In our culture, there's many people that believe that a, in a version of a God who is one with nature. And that is not the God that's revealed in the Bible. Right? He is above, he is separate, he is greater than. It's hard for us to grasp. So if, if someone were to ask, ask, how big is your God? Well, a simple way to say he's, he's certainly bigger than the universe. You'd have to say, well, how is that? Yeah, he's bigger than the universe because he made the universe. Bigger than all creation. Oh, than all creation. Not just this earth, bigger than it all. And so we can't even grasp how big is God. Bigger than the universe. Because we, I can't even grasp how big the universe is. Notice verse 26. Who has created these things. And he's talking there about the stars and the planets. The things when you see, you see when you look up. He calls them by name by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one is missing. God knows exactly where they are. Uh, another characteristic or attribute of God um, is that, that he's, so not only is he separate, but he is the creator. As Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. He did. God is all-powerful and, um, or another way of saying that, omnipotent. He's all-powerful. Mm -hmm. Verses 27 and 28 reveal that God is all-knowing and eternal. That's what he was saying when he said, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My just claim is passed over by God. Have you not known? Have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. We can't get to the end of God's knowledge. He's revealed some, of, some to us, what we can handle. That's what the Bible is. It's what we can handle. He hasn't revealed everything he didn't claim to. Some people would say, well, why are I have more questions about God than what the Bible reveals. Well, you will get to take that to him. If you trust him on what he's given you, <laughs> then he may let you ask those questions someday. But if you don't believe what he's given already, he isn't gonna, there isn't going to be another time to ask that question. The, the secret things belong to God. The revealed things belong to us and to our children. That's what he's He's given us some, the revealed things. And verses um, 29 to 31, he gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. That's incredible. Because not only is God all-powerful, and he's beyond this universe. He's personal. That's what it says. He, he enjoys interacting with humans. He even transfers some of his great power to us. That's incredible. Amen. That he, he gives us some of his strength, those that wait on him. Uh, look at, uh, in chapter 41, we'll skim some of these. Uh, verses 8 to 10. 41, 8 to 10. But you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend, 
You hear the personalness of God. He says, you whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest regions and said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not cast you away. Fear not, for I am with you. Does that sound familiar? It's how Jesus left us, right? He says, I am with you always. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's the thing. Our God is strong and he's willing to strengthen us. Praise God. In the midst of our weakness, he reaches into our lives like a father taking a hold of a child who's starting to stumble. I don't know if you've seen some of those Facebook videos of the dads who happen to catch a side glimpse of a little kid tumbling off of something and catch them. It was, whoa, that was really good. But our God isn't just picking up on the peripherals. He's watching us. He knows us. He catches us. Praise God. Look then from, in verses 13 to 14. For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, Fear not, I will help you. Fear not, you worm, Jacob, you men of Israel. I will help you, says the Lord, and your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. So God, He, he knows us. What does He call them? You worm, Jacob. You know, we sing Amazing Grace, and some people don't like to say that, uh, uh, that saved a wretch like me. But the reality is, God knows us in our wretchedness. He knows our sin. He knows when we fail. And that doesn't scare Him off. That caused Him to come up with this great plan of redemption. That He loves us. And He is just. He's bold. He has His righteous right hand. He's just. And yet, the scripture says, he is just and the one who justifies the ungodly. That's what's crazy. He knows that we don't meet his standard. That doesn't change his standard at all. But he's come up with a way to save us, even under that standard, to go beyond the standard. People will say, God loves us unconditionally. And I say, no, no. He loves us in spite of the condition." He goes beyond that. It's not just unconditionally, because he doesn't just say, oh, I have no rules. He says, no, I have rules, and you can't handle those rules. Right? And he says, but I'm going to send somebody who can. Right? That's what we'll talk about next week. But anyway, so God the Father is the one that initiated the plan. Jesus gives him full credit for that. In fact, when, when Jesus came to earth, and we'll have to talk more about this next week. He didn't stop being God. He's still God. But he voluntarily laid aside and didn't use some of his attributes, the attributes of God. And he said, in fact, you know, no one knows the day or the hour when the Son of Man will come. He wasn't going to tell them when he's going to return. He says, the Father knows that. At that point... God the Son had said, no, that's the Father's job. I'm not touching that one. He's got it, right? And it's like in an office, sometimes you delegate things. And you're all one team, but one of you handles certain things. And uh, praise God for dividing the labor sometimes. You know, you, you have to do that to keep your sense, your, your mind. And uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have determined in, this, in one God, they've determined which one will do certain things. And that's, that's what we see. All right, I'll try to see. I'm not going to keep you late. But there's just so much good stuff. I don't know. I can't even begin to, to get into this today. But, um, all right, we, we see, like in chapter 44, God goes into a, a very long <laughs> section about how crazy it is to make a thing your God. Uh, and, and I'm trying to see, where is that? 44 verses. Um, I, I would start with even verse, the end of verse 14. Things like this. A person plants a pine and the rain nourishes it. 
Then it shall be for a man to burn, that's wood, and he will take some of it and warm himself, and he kindles it and bakes bread, and indeed he makes a god and worships it. He makes a carved image and falls down before it. And, and then, uh, let's see, toward the end of verse 17 he says, and he falls down before it and worships it, prays to it and says, deliver me, for you are my God. And that's the craziness, and it's meant to be. This looks insane, that you grew this from a plant, you know what it is, and now you're bowing to it, saying it's your God. Well, the fact is, we do the same thing. Sometimes we go to the store, we buy something. And then, I know I've fallen into this too. We treasure it beyond relationships with others. We treasure that thing. I had a guitar that I kept for many years. Didn't have a scratch on it. Bought it in 1977. We still have it in our house. Doesn't look anything like when I was in charge of it. I let it go. Like <laughs> the kids, the kids have played with it. Everybody's played with it. I had to let it go because I tried to keep it beautiful. But when the thing becomes a god mm -hmm. and it stops you from enjoying the relationships, you have to let it go. And that's what I. So praise God. Now I haven't done that with everything. My wife knows. I struggle with this. There are things that, you know, we, we, but if you cling to a thing and it interrupts a relationship, God says, it's become an idol. It's become a God to you. Be careful what you fall in love with. And the, the reality is that sometimes even our own relationships be, can become an idol. We can love people and not love God. So we've got to be careful. Um, Isaiah, I guess I'll, I don't know where to wrap this up, because it's going too long. <laughs> we just had so much we wanted to do today. Um, all through this section, God keeps repeating the same kind of an idea as in 43.11. You know, backwards in that one. 43.11, he says, I... Even I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. And then he tells Israel and Judah, you are my witnesses. For I am God. Indeed, before the day was, before any day was, he's saying, I am He. And there is no one who can deliver out of my hand. I work, and who will reverse it? He says, when I do something, it's done. That's who it is. And in verse 15, he says, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. And that's what we need to, to get into our heads. We have one King. And yet, God can use people. And he did that in, in chapter 45. In chapter 45, you have to see this, because this is a beautiful thing. And it relates to what's happening all around us. God can raise up a man or a woman. He can raise up leaders and he can place that person in a place of, of authority and he can open doors of opportunity for that person. And look at what he did in, in uh, chapter 45, verse 1. So that, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings and open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the, the bars of iron. What he's saying is, this, he's calling this person, this leader, Cyrus, who wouldn't come for, for a long time. Well, the, the people were in captivity in Babylon for 70 years. And then God raised up Cyrus to lead them, to send them out. God knew his name. He called him by name. And in fact, in verse 4, he says, I have named you, though you have not known me. I am the Lord. He repeats that again. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God besides me. God can raise up leaders for us. Amen. Amen? And I think we've got to close. But this week, we're going to find out who the leader is for our, for our nation. And I believe we need to pray. Either way this goes. Because the, 
These chapters in Isaiah start with comfort. Yes, comfort my people. And I believe God will use this time in our lives. But we need to release it, wait on Him, trust Him. In the midst of this, whether, whether the decision goes the way you want it to, whether it goes the way I want it to or not, we trust God through it all, that He is bringing people into power. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we, we trust You, O God, that You are the great God of the universe, the creator of all. Lord, all things are in your control. I pray, oh God, that you would help us as we go into this week. Some of us gathered here have already cast our votes. Some will be doing that, that this week. We have the next two days, that's it. And then, Lord, it's in your hands. I ask you, oh God, that you would Reign over this nation, O oh God, in power and might. Lord, that you would keep your people free to preach the gospel, even out on the streets. Help us, O oh God, as a nation to, to lift you high. I pray, O oh God, that, that you would guide and direct each of us as, as we fulfill that duty to vote, Lord. Help us to vote knowing, God, that you are in control. And so I ask you, no matter which way this election goes, Lord, that it would be in your great plan for us. Help us to wait on you, to trust you. Lord, we have seen you raise up leaders in days gone by, and we trust you for the same thing now. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, give us that comfort. Help us to trust you. And, we, and may you unite us, Lord, as we seek to, to become what you've called us to be, a family united, Lord, to share your love, to share your gospel, to bless each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you'd like more information about anything you heard today or to inquire about online giving, you can reach us online at www.woodlawnri.org or meet with us on Sunday morning at 1030 a.m. at 337 Lonsdale Avenue in Pawtucket. May God richly bless you.